key drivers of the EU's post-recovery and could actually help accelerate the economic growth. Um, however, with the economic disruption and restricted travel and political tensions, there may be a slightly less room for European ventures to scale up beyond uh, their domestic market. Uh, Andre, I would like to turn to you first uh, as someone who, who is helping Czech founders from CEE to realize their global ambitions through Frida Ventures. Uh, in your opinion, what are the key assets of the CEE startup ecosystem? Sure. So first of all, Susanna, thank you so much for having me. Um, in terms of the key assets, I think Central and Eastern Europe is historically known for outstanding engineering talent. Now, what has changed in the past 10 years or so, though, is the perception of that engineering talent and the potential that it can deliver. So, you know, if you look at a, a startup mecca like Silicon Valley or East Coast or, or, or London, like the belief was uh, that you had to move your team to that mecca to really start the business. Uh, and what I think has changed in the past decade uh, with successful companies such as UiPath or GTM Hub, which we have here today with us, is that it is no longer a disadvantage to have that engineering talent based in the CE. On the contrary, it has become a, a big competitive advantage. Now that you have the world-class engineering talent, which is uh, you know, four to five times cheaper than engineering talent in the US, and particularly during COVID when everybody is working remotely anyways, having an engineering office in one of these big hubs uh, turned out to be a big competitive advantage. Uh, one additional advantage that I see in the CEE region uh, is actually the size of the domestic markets. Our domestic markets are uh, small enough that if a founder wants to build a big company out of CEE, such founder has to think internationally or globally from day one. So unlike some of the larger economies of, for example, Western Europe, where many founders would be happy to be number one of something in France, Germany, or Italy, being number one of something in Romania, Bulgaria, Slovakia, or Czech Republic is not deemed sufficient enough for a lot of our founders. So in many ways, CEE can deliver outstanding tech talent and uh, much uh, more ambition and hunger than we sometimes see in the West. I can, I can definitely imagine that. Uh, Ivan, I would like to turn to you now as, as the CEO of a, successful, of a successful startup from the region, uh, which certainly had to address the challenges posed by the COVID-19. We know that in the late uh, 2019, uh, 19, GTM had revealed it had secured an 8.1 million euro Series A funding and uh, you were planning to expand global operation and operations and, and release substantial updates to your product. Uh, so how, has, uh, how was your strategy influenced by the pandemic, if at all? Um, <clears throat> yes, again, thank you for the invitation, uh, Susanna. Um, I, I think I, I would echo a lot of things that Andre said, um, that basically because of the reasons that he had outlined, uh, we were kind of global, remote, if you will, company from day one, even, even though we were small. And uh, to that end, it, things did not change a lot. There is, uh, I mean, the, the strategy was not changed a lot. Things that happened like flying to US, which I used to do once a month, uh, that's, that's obviously not happening. But uh, uh, I would say because of these, like uh, uh, because of the need to, to be remote, digital only from the very beginning, because uh, I remember when we were four people, we had one person in Japan, one in, U in, in London and, and two in Sofia, right? So you are kind of this kind of company, I would say the COVID company type of company from day one. Uh, and for us, it, it, not a lot of things changed aside from, you know, not going to the office and, and, and I would say kind of small inconveniences comparing to, to some other companies which, which uh, were for different reasons not set up in a way that we had to be set up. We had no choice, right? And they then had to go to a transition. So uh, not a lot has changed. That's, that's definitely good to hear in this sense. Uh, Varga, we heard some exciting news recently about UiPath. Um, the, I mean, the recent announcement of a uh, 190 million euro Series E funding. Uh, and it seems like the pandemic has pushed uh, robotic process automation to the forefront as, as companies look for ways to automate more quickly. So can you share with us uh, what are the next milestones for UiPath? 
Well, again, thank you for having me. Yes, uh, we, uh, as you mentioned, the uh, when the <clears throat> COVID uh, started, we, like every uh, business people, we didn't know what will happen to us or what will happen to the industry. And yes, we realized, in fact, that uh, we had actually a lot of requests because people all of, all of a sudden needed to automate many of their processes in a matter of urgency. Uh, to give you a couple of examples, uh, we did some pro bono work for hospitals uh, in, in Ireland in many other places where nurses uh, were spending a fair amount of their time, 30 to 50% of their time, to actually record the results of the test because they have to report to the government on a daily basis how many people. And then we, we, we put in the robots, deployed robots, and you know we were able to give the time back to the nurses. Or airlines and, and etc. You know, people that needed government to to provide loans and and, and, and banks or installments of loans. So uh, the actually, if anything, the uh, the demand for our product uh, spiked, uh, which was a good surprise. And I think, like remote working, uh, this is a, a pivotal moment. So uh, people all of a sudden realize that automation of uh, of tasks and, and processes. Uh, is something that can really help them and, and, and here's, uh, it's here to stay. So for us, it's a good thing. Uh, in terms of what's coming up, I think it's no secret that uh, our CEO has mentioned it. We, uh, uh, we will try to prepare ourselves for, uh, uh, for an IPO of our company next year. Uh, when, that will depend obviously on market conditions, but uh, we will be ready uh, to go uh, sometimes next year uh, uh, and, and really... Uh, uh, do a, an IPO. Well, that's definitely very exciting news to hear. Here and uh, best luck, best luck with that. We will be following that very closely. Uh, Andre, I have one one question for you. Can you maybe help us zoom into the most promising industry verticals in the CE region at the very moment? And maybe if these priorities, if these in, um, verticals changed after the pandemic, what was the change, or whether they're they're the same? They're, they're still the same. Sure. So uh, I think we have to come back to sort of what are the essential ingredients of CE success. And if we define that as engineering talent uh, and the ambition to be successful globally, then the question is, where does a top-notch engineering talent have a competitive advantage? And what we found throughout our 10-year experience in venture investing is that, broadly speaking, B2B software tends to suit CEE startups better because you have this ambitious product roadmap uh, where you are trying to attract a big enterprise on a fairly sophisticated or robust product and having the ability to hire a high number of talented engineers in very early stages uh, of company development in CEE is actually a big source of competitive advantage if you compare it to I don't know, a startup that is based somewhere in Silicon Valley who has to have two to three million dollar investment just to pay the salary of the founders and a couple of engineers. So historically, I believe uh, a lot of successes that came for CEE globally were on the uh, B2B enterprise software side, just like UiPath, just like GTM Habar. Um, and from this perspective, I believe that's what's going to happen in the next decade as well. Now, in terms of the specific verticals, um, that I think is tougher to predict. Uh, you know, you asked me about what can change with the onset of COVID. Historically, CE, because they were always good developers, have a lot of dev tooling. They have a lot of team collaboration and sort of remote collaboration tools because this is how our teams work. They were always remote. There were always multiple countries involved. So I believe that those uh, are going to thrive uh, in the next decade as well. And I think that we are going to continue seeing new products being developed that will tailor for perhaps a permanent change in how people approach working in the office versus working remotely. So I think this is a great opportunity for the next decade for CE startups. Yeah, I see. And uh, have we seen a decrease from uh, flow of capital from outside of the EU? And has that impa impa impacted the potential of European startups could, to get funding from, from the US, for example? Uh, look, uh, 
I have more of anecdotal evidence than, than a hard data, but what I can tell you is that uh, venture capital as an asset class is flush with money, particularly in the US, uh, but the same can be said uh, about at least Western Europe. And the problem of what has happened now is you have this flush of money, which was already available before COVID, and then you have two tiers of startups, those that are facing tailwinds thanks to COVID, and those that are facing headwinds thanks to COVID. So if, it, let's say it was 50-50 distributed, what you ended up seeing now is that there is a lot of money being deployed into startups that have benefited from COVID, and that has driven up the valuations and investment activity in that space. And then you have seen an outflow of capital in startup that are, startups that are currently facing some headwinds. Um, another factor that's important to mention is that a lot of VCs have started to conduct deals solely over Zoom. Even we have done a deal into a team we have never met before, and we just had a few Zoom calls. Zoom calls. So that's a new reality that is here for at least uh, medium term to stay. And that means that that U.S. capital now uh, has relaxed the rules about how to invest in international jurisdictions, including CEE, where they are now much more willing to conduct deals remotely. So my anecdotal evidence would conclude that for those startups that are facing or are having tailwinds from COVID, there is actually an inflow of capital from global financial markets because they are now conducting their business remotely as well. That's definitely positive news uh, in these difficult times. Uh, Ivan, I have a question again for you. So we know that uh, for real innovation to happen, it's important to have some space for early favor, failure and failure in general. So in your opinion, does the CEE region have sufficiently supportive conditions for early stage startups? Uh, well, I think it, it it does. It's getting better all the time. Uh, I think there is a there is a large amount of accelerators and especially early stage funding seems to be uh, uh, available in, a, in 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 more than sufficient, I would say, um, amounts. Uh, what I think is maybe a bit different, and I'm not sure if this is just a uh, CE uh, CE eating or or in in general, more of a European thing that I don't think failure is really ever looked looked upon as something uh, as a learning opportunity. Uh, and there is a bit of, uh, I would say, a stigma uh, that comes to that, which, you know, is, is could be a, a good or bad thing. Um, <clears throat> but uh, just speaking about, you know, um, I cannot talk about the whole region. I have really experience only uh, 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 from Bulgaria and just anecdotally from Croatia because I'm uh, I'm originally from there. Uh, in Bulgaria, I think in in Sofia at least in in the capital, it's it's quite easy uh, to to start a company. Uh, things like you know uh, flexible uh, uh, co-working spaces, which didn't exist maybe I don't know five seven years ago, uh, are available. Capital is available. A lot of I would say services are now specializing for example we have accountants who actually do know they specialize in SaaS accounting which you know it's a it's a funny thing to to mention but back in the day when we were starting it was uh i actually had to explain to to our accountant how you recognize SaaS revenue you know that he doesn't recognize it the day it comes uh so i think that there is a uh maybe also there is a, a kind of a second wave i think we are in, in many ways a second wave of startups so you, you have mentors you have people who went through uh, fundraising, who went through uh, <laughs> exits, uh, hiring, firing, uh, uh, you know. So I think it's, um, it's, it's, I, I don't think it's ever easy, uh, but I don't think we, we can talk about, you know, just being uh, uh, at some unfair disadvantage because, you know, we are in Bulgaria, or Romania, or, or Hungary, or anywhere. I think it's, uh, it's, the, it's uh, the, the, the playing field has been leveled, I would say. Uh, Varga, from your perspective, so do we do see startups have enough supportive conditions from the, the wider ecosystem, meaning funding, meaning accelerator? What is your perspective? I think there are two different things. I think uh, Ivan spoke mainly, if I'm not mistaken, about startup. I think the startup conditions and things has definitely improved, and I can even see it as, a, uh, as Andres says anecdotally, they are 
in Romania, there were no early stage investors at all. And now there are several of them and so on. But I think when it gets to scaling up, it's a different story altogether. And I would not say that the scaling up environment or, or knowledge or, or, or fundamentals are still there. Uh, Andre said correctly that the good news is, I, I always say that jokingly, I said we were born global because any market uh, was bigger than the Romanian market for us. So we went everywhere simultaneously. Uh, and it's true. So it creates in mindset. Actually, interesting enough, if you look at the really unicorns from Europe, most of them come from very small markets, uh, being Skype, being us, being uh, Log Me In, and so on. They all come from, they don't come from the major Germany, France, or, or whatever. But I think that there's still some fundamentals that are missing, uh, some fundamentals in terms of, uh, indeed, the next generation of VCs that can really put the big tickets. But the good news is that uh, uh, based on some of the names that I mentioned as successes, you see the Americans starting to come and hunt in this region. And, and, and we need to have uh, the, the founders in this region, like Ivan has done, like uh, we have done. Uh, they have to have the courage to immediately, or, or not immediately, but quite soon in the journey, uh, move across the pond and, and, and go to the US market. Uh, because if you want to be a global uh, uh, IT player, uh, you need to be uh, in the most important market, both in terms of the market for your product, but also the, the, the source of talent and the richest tech ecosystem in the world, which still remains the US uh, today. So, it, so the, we, we have to get out of the region uh, because no, there is no ecosystem. There are no analyst shops in, the, in, in, in Eastern Europe. There are not really scale of VCs in Eastern Europe. Uh, there is not the, the talent of people that know how to scale up companies in Eastern Europe. So the scale up has to be done outside of our home region. Absolutely. Yeah, I understand. And what do you think? What kind of government policies, be it on the EU level or, or national level, uh, could help uh, help support uh, CEE tech startups uh, also and kind of help them with the expansion as well? Is a question for me or? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Vaga, please. And then Ivan can answer and then obviously Andre can answer as well. <laughs> so the question was, what can the governments do or the EU Yes, do? yes. What kind of government policies would be welcome and, and would really support startups in, in their expansion as well and would make, make it easier for them? You know, uh, I think the country that the EU in general and the CE in particular uh, will be very well uh, inspired to look at is Israel. Uh, if you look at Israel, a relatively small nation, and what they have achieved, and make no mistake, they haven't achieved this just because there was a bunch of extraordinary entrepreneurs, even though I think the Israeli society has reasons to develop good entrepreneurs. It was really because of governmental action. And it's the same with the Silicon Valley. I mean, people think it's a land of free and, and libertarian. The Silicon Valley exists thanks to the U.S. government. I'm not going to get into this. It's a controversial, but it's a fact. So if you look at uh, what governments do in general, uh, they, they, they have an amazing, important role to create the conditions for innovation and, and startups to grow. Uh, they have a role to play in education uh, to, to make sure that there, are in, there is enough talent uh, in, in, in the region. Uh, they have a role to play in... Um, uh, encouraging investment, either by creating the right investment environment through stable uh, legislation and favorable fiscal policies, but as well as uh, directly uh, uh, investing in innovation, either in R&D uh, very early on, or for instance, like the, again, Israel government that is funding 25 uh, incubators in Israel, up to 85% of early stage investment is guaranteed by the Israeli government. Uh, so that encourages uh, these things. So governments have a multiple role to play. And one last role that is very important uh, is government as buyers of technology that is being invented in their own region. And I have to say that I think particularly on the last one, EU is failing miserably. Uh, there, I'll give you an example in our case, uh, uh, we have 60 uh, federal agencies in the U.S. as a client. We have zero European uh, uh, public sector clients. Zero. 
it's sad. So, yes, government has a big role to play. And uh, I think there's still a lot to do for EU to catch up to best practices. Mm -hmm. Andre, what is your perspective since you really have a really broad overview of many startup success stories from the CE region and what is their relation to the, the government support they did receive or they did not receive and what could help startups from the government side? Uh, yeah, so, you know, broadly speaking, sort of as a wish list, uh, at the end of the day, both, both Varga and Ivan uh, said the same thing that uh, when they were considering this expansion from CEE, U.S. was the number one on the priority list. And the reason for that is that at the end of the day, U.S. is one singular market. But if a CEE company decides to expand uh, somewhere in the EU, they are not sort of choosing between U.S. and EU. They are choosing between U.S. and Germany or France or U.K. And the problem with that is that you incur the very similar expansion costs in terms of learning how to sell on that market, building up your brand, but you incur it on each of those smaller domestic markets. So a logical question which will fall from that is, why would I as a young startup spend the money and time to try to go from CE to Germany first, if I might as well just go to the US which is a much bigger market than, say, Germany or France individually. And at the same time, they are used to buying stuff from other startups. Uh, so if I was to put something on my wish list is that, like, we just need to finish the EU integration so startups can choose between US and EU as opposed to US and France and uh, Germany and uh, UK individually, because in that case, it will never make sense. It's just not an attractive market from global perspective. Uh, so broadly speaking, there's a... Uh, macro policy, which I would uh, love to see. Uh, and, and then micro speaking, look, I think there are a bunch of tactical things that can help er in early stages of startup life, right? Like startup is a very particular type of entity that at its beginning requires a lot of cash, requires an ability to uh, distribute equity among a lot of shareholders, employees, set corporate governance between those employees, founders, and investors. And most of this is not in place today in, in, in the particular jurisdictions of each of the CEE countries. So having things like an ability to have a stock options plan in our entities, having things like enforcing minority rights or enforcing investor rights or founder rights, sort of basic things that are table stakes in the US are still something unheard of in most of the CEE jurisdictions today. Yeah, I see. Ivan, do you have do you have your perspective on that? As you were building GTM Hub, uh, have you encountered some sort of roadblocks or on the other hand, great opportunities from the side of government or I don't know, some other opportunities uh, provided by the EU market? Well, um, I, I would say that we were... Uh, oh, um, so it seems like Commissioner managed to join us. Commissioner, can you, can you hear us? We're not sure, we're not sure. Uh, Hello. Hi, Commissioner, can you hear us? Yes, I hear you. I'm so sorry for this technical problem. Oh, no worries. No worries about that. We were waiting for you patiently, but since uh, we have a lot, of, uh, a lot to speak about, we have uh, started with Yadao too, and we have started, you know, uh, analyzing the, the situation for the, the CE startups um, under the, the current uh, COVID uh, pandemic and also kind of like uh, outlooks for the future. And uh, I hope, Ivan, you will uh, excuse me if I maybe uh, jump in and, and uh, interrupt you for a bit and we can get back to back to your answer in a bit. Uh, but we have a, a couple of uh, very burning questions for the commissioner to answer. So uh, like one of, the, one of the first questions we actually wanted to ask you, uh, commissioner, was that we were talking about how the uh, how the situation for uh, for uh, European startups is really tricky these days due to the economic disruption caused by COVID, restricted travel, political tension, and that there might be less room for European venture to scale up beyond their domestic markets under current circumstances. 
So my question for you would be, how can the EU and national governments help rectify this situation? Well, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, I listened very carefully to the, the previous speakers, and I would like really to thank them because it's quite important for me to receive these kind of inputs because I fully agree we have challenges, we have problems, but at the same time, I would like really to, to, to stress what are our efforts because you are completely right. Uh, the current COVID situation creates many challenges and opportunities, but for some startups, COVID means a problem of cash flow uh, that is impeding their ability to scale up. But for others, that means that they can pivot and have access to markets which were traditionally close to startups, such as education and health markets. And that's why, for me, as a European commissioner, it's very, very important to see how on the base of what, what we already achieved, and apparently we have equities, and it's, it's, it's true, how we can increase now our support for startups, because I fully believe that innovators and entrepreneurial startups will be among the main drivers of technological advances, economic growth, and job creation in this post-COVID uh, Europe. Um, and that's why, first uh, on our side, I would like really to, to mention that with our initiative Startup Europe since 2011, we, we managed to create digital hubs all over uh, of our member states. But at the same time, we have seen that it's not enough. Definitely, Startup Europe has already helped support it. Uh, 770 startups to scale up, and many of them have become successful European stories. But now we have another instrument, and that's what I would like to bring to your attention, because in Horizon Europe program, I would like to see how our activities will be scaled up with the European Innovation Council, because I, I stay determined to ensure that Central and Eastern Euro Europe innovation ecosystem take full advantage of these instruments. And that's why for the European Innovation Council, uh, we proposed a budget of 10 billion euros that will provide a combination of grants and equity of up to 15 million to individual startups. And we created a new European Innovation Council fund. The budget of this fund is three and a half billion euros. And we would like to see this fund like the largest fund specialized on deep tech in Europe because the fund will provide equity and quasi-equity investments of half a million to 15 million euros in return of 10% to 25% ownership stakes in the companies with non dilutive effect on ownership. Um, and I hope that at least we have a starting point that together with the European Innovation Council and the European Innovation Council Fund will fill the funding gap at the startup stage. I listen very carefully to Varga uh, we maybe now in Europe we have more early stage investment, but we need the investment for scaling up. And that's why allow me to share with you that with the European Innovation Council, we have a special instrument, the accelerator, where we'll be ready to provide a quick funding and to help startups to scale up. But I'd like here to insist how much uh, is important to work in synergy, in synergy with the other funds of the European Union, and to be sure that there will be ecosystems that was raised already. And for me, that's something that was not achieved before. That's why even with my portfolio, I would like to see how, for example, the European Innovation and Technology Institute will work together with the European Innovation Council. Why not to propose that the European Innovation and Technology Institute identify promising companies in Central and Eastern Europe and that means that they will have quick access to funding with the European Innovation Council. That's something new. We have to propose it, and I'm, I'm really ready to work on this. The same in Horizon Europe, we will have something quite new, our Horizon Europe missions on climate adaptation, on smart cities, on water. So I can't imagine that we'll be able to achieve results with our missions without startups. And by the way, today it's a very... A uh, special day for me because I launched a call of 1 billion euro, a Green Deal call, where I invite all the startups in the region to, to, to postulate and to show us that there is a huge potential because the region is extremely talented. The region now, the last year, increased the robustness of, of, uh, of some of the innovation uh, ecosystem policies, but we need to do much more. 
thank you so much, Commissioner, for your input. I have uh, I have one more question directed at you. I will make the most of your limited time being here. So uh, we have, Commissioner, we have witnessed uh, with great interest the latest discussions in the innovation ecosystem around the new single space for innovators, the European Innovation Area, and how could such high-level policy measures stimulate the startup uh, ecosystem in, in CEE? What can the startups uh, really expect from, from this uh, high-level policy framework? Well, thank you very much. That's uh, my latest idea. I think that we have the European research area, we have European education area. There is no reason not to have a European innovation area. And what is, what is the objective of this idea is really to see how we can stimulate the startup ecosystem in Central and Eastern Europe, everywhere in Europe, in order to allow the innovators to reach out to investors in other parts of Europe, as well as to soft land in new markets across the, the European Union. For me, this single space for innovators can also have an important role on reducing the innovation divide across Europe. You know, that's one of my main priorities. I, I can't accept the, the actual numbers. I can see what are the, the arguments, what, are, what, what is the, the pathway, but at the same time, I fully believe that you'd like to affirm a European leadership. That means leadership for all our region, for all our member states, for all our startups. And that's why I'm very eager to receive input about how the innovators from the region believe that the European innovation area should be designed so that it helps them in their journey to become global tech leaders. In any case, for me, we need to work on the three C's, if I may, connecting people, capital, and competence. First, strong connections between all stakeholders must be sustained not only nationally, but across borders, where new coordination tools must be developed uh, in order just to see the Europe's incredible diversity and ecosystem complexity. And it is also critical to maintain a holistic view of the capital available in the ecosystem. While scale-ups are certainly a priority, um, it is essential to continue investing in early stage companies and to support and enable trial and error and the scaling up of innovative pilots from the public sector. And finally, the, the innovators and founders need to get the right balance of competence within the team of the startup. Access to talent is the number one challenge for all European startups to grow. However, Central and Eastern Europe region has a very well-educated talent. We need to ensure that Central and Eastern Europe innovators have access to this talent so that the most brilliant developers and creative people are not forced to leave their country. And that's why uh, in, in Horizon Europe, I, the Horizon Europe program, I will pay a special attention to, to this. Uh, we have tools at our disposal, not only for ecosystems, it's uh, only 500 uh, million euros, but okay, it's a starting point. But together, only together we can really launch this new era that is innovation-driven, entrepreneurial, resilient, and inclusive for all. And that's, that's the, 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 the big ambition of the innovation area, but I need your input, I need your experiences, and I need your ideas. Thank you very much, Commissioner. We are very much uh, very excited for the for the upcoming initiative, and we'll be following closely what it means for CE startups. And I will make sure to gather some feedback, maybe organize some some other sessions on that. And I have one very last question for you: uh, Which startup stories, uh, startup success stories, or country level initiatives from the region could serve as an example for other entrepreneurs to follow? In your in your view. Well, we have one of one of these success stories with us, uh, with my fellow speaker Varda. You is uh, on the stage. Uh, what what is important for me, maybe first to say to, to see that performance increased in 24 European countries since 2012, with the biggest increases in Lithuania, Malta, Latvia, Portugal, and Greece, and one of the central and eastern European countries, Estonia, proudly takes place among the countries that are strong innovators. For the first time, Slovenia and Latvia are into the top 40 countries with the most developed startup ecosystems. And now we can see different cities, Tallinn, Warsaw, Vilnius, Prague, Sofia, Budapest, on the top world 100 cities ranking list. And 
I think that we have a very good examples because there are no less than 12 unicorns coming from the Central and Eastern Europe. And I believe its number will increase in the future because we have three parts, but moreover, there are great newcomers to the region, including the winners of the Central European Startup Award, 2019 winner, June, a Romanian artificial intelligence company develops a no-code chatbot design platform uh, to help any organization plan, develop, and deploy chatbots. In 2018, the Polish EdTech platform, which has been awarded the title of Startup of the Year, and in July 2019, Brainly raised 27 million euro as part of a Series C with investors like Trossos. So that's my message. I want to encourage all innovators in CE to try and launch a startup in their countries. The EU, at least as I'm, as I'm the commissioner, will be there to, to support them with the programs that I have mentioned before. There has never been a better time to launch an innovative company in Europe. Now we have great challenges in front of us, the digitalization, the Green Deal. But now we need to see how with more mature ecosystems and with well-targeted investments in our European programs, we can help our startups to become the global tech leaders of tomorrow. Thank you very much, Commissioner, for your in encouraging words. Uh, and thank you very much, everyone, for the engaging discussions. I'm very sorry to say that uh, we are running out of time now, so we'll have to uh, close the discussion now. Uh, we will be actually addressing very similar topics related to a digital future and innovations with uh, many high-level speakers at our flagship events, Globsec Forum and Tatra Summit in October. And there will be more information about that coming on our website and social media, so feel free to follow us there. So on that note, uh, 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 we'll be closing today's session. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. Thank you, Commissioner, for joining us today. Thank you, Varga, Ivan and Andrei. And I, I hope we can we can talk at, at some other occasion. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.